Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second day of Zing 2021. Oh, it's so nice to be here. Good afternoon for you folks, too. Uh, we are here in, in, at every time in the world. So now we have six great papers in this section. I want you to enjoy as much as you can. We thank you, everyone, to be here with us. Uh, the guys that are in the late afternoon, the guys that are very early in the morning, too. So we will start with a wonderful first paper. It's a journal first paper, uh, the who, what, how of soft engineering research, a social technical framework. And Margaret and Storr will present. Thank you very much for the lovely introduction. And hello, everyone. I'm uh, Margaret Ann from University of Victoria. And uh, I'm actually joined today as well by Courtney Williams. Uh, you can see her picture on the bottom left there. We're both in Victoria, Canada, BC, and it's 4 a.m. here. Uh, it's my pleasure today to present to you our journal first paper, The Who, What, How Software Engineering Research that was published in MZ, as you heard. And in this paper, we present a framework that we use for reflecting about the research that we do and we can apply it to a specific paper or to a set of papers published in a particular conference, such as this one, or even possibly use it in a systematic literature review or mapping study. So the framework asks three questions about the research that we do. Who does the research aim to benefit? What kind of contribution do we aim at? And how do we do our research? And I'll finally close my short talk with some remarks about how apply applying the framework may nudge us towards more impactful research. So in our journal paper, uh, we apply the framework actually to two software engineering research venues, um, ICSI and the Springer Journal on Empirical Software Engineering um, in 2017, and that is to a total of 151 paper, papers. As a bonus for the talk today, I'm going to mention how I have also applied this framework to this conference, to ESUM, to the technical uh, track papers, because one of the reviewers um, suggested that we do that. So I'm going to offer that up at the end. So stay tuned for that. So first, let me start off with the who and who we aim to benefit through the research that we do. So software engineering is socio-technical. I think we all know that these days. And some of our contributions may entirely be related to improving technical aspects of the code that we write or the tools that we use, or solely to human aspects. But most of the time, our research at some point is likely to bump into this intersection between the two. For example, if we want to understand why GitHub is so successful at supporting open source projects, we need to really look at this, this uh, intersection between social and technical aspects. And in fact, GitHub does an amazing job of optimizing both sides so that it actually works for the tasks that they set out for it to do. But it's also important to note that some of our research is more fundamental. And it's aimed, at least in the short term, at supporting other researchers. So for example, papers that publish systematic literature reviews and artifacts for use by the research community, such as GH Torrent, these are all contributions that are aimed at the researchers and ultimately may have some impact on software practitioners and the tools that they use. So when we applied the WHO uh, part of the framework to the 151 papers, we see that many of these papers do claim to do research that benefits human stakeholders. And in fact, 72 of them are at this intersection between socio-technical and then a further 44 really focus on the humans. And so, for example, this paper here looks at uh, fault localization. And so it's aimed at improving the tool, but also aimed at improving the developers that use the tool. So that was the who part. Let's look at the second part, the what. So for this, we're, we're concerned with the types of knowledge contribution that we tend to produce. And we don't mean here contributions characterized by topics such as security or testing, but rather the nature of the contribution from the papers. So to understand what we produce in terms of the knowledge in our papers, I'm actually borrowing uh, from Van Aken et al, their uh, categorization of the different kind of research that we do. And I'm focused particularly on empirical research, which turns out is most of the papers in our research venues in software engineering are empirical in some way. 
And on, in one, on the one hand, the first category that we use in our classification, we call these descriptive contributions. And these are the kind of contributions that you would typically see in the explanatory sciences. So they lead us to theories that describe what's going on, or maybe theories that help us predict what will happen if we change a tool or bring in a new intervention. The second category comes from what Van Aken calls the design sciences and captures the solutions and interventions that will address a particular problem. So that is a contribution here is knowledge about the design of an intervention or tool. So these are the two kinds that we think about in terms of the contributions that we produce. So applying this part of the framework to the ICSI and MZ papers, we find that in ICSI, most of the papers are framed as solution papers. So that is the, the new tool, uh, they, they suggest a new tool or new tool features. Uh, for example, a tool could be to recommend which APIs to use. And I should have mentioned that we came up with this classification by reading all of these papers uh, several times and the abstracts and deciding how we would decide which of these, uh, how to answer these questions for the papers. While in MZ, more of the papers provided descriptive contributions over solutions. So here we have insights on the problems we have or insights on pre-existing tools. So for example, a paper that reports on the challenges developers may face using security tools would be classed as a descriptive contribution. So it's interesting to see that we're seeing some difference here between ICSI and MZ. And later on, let's see what we have for this conference. So finally, we consider the last part of the framework, which is concerned with the how our research is conducted and which strategies are used. So we can think about strategies in terms of non-empirical, which I show on the left here, and also empirical research strategies. So non-empirical are those papers that use formal theory in some way or conduct meta research. So for example, a literature review. And on the right, we see the four types of empirical strategies. Let me drill into those. So the top right quadrant here refers to research strategies that are conducted in the field, in industry, such as a field experiment. So for example, to evaluate a new intervention in comparison to an older one, we might do an experiment. A field study, on the other hand, would look at trying to understand or do a case study and understand a phenomenon in the field. Going left and at the top, lab, lab strategies involve lab studies or experiments, but with developers in a contrived setting. And then down from that, we have the respondent strategies. These include interviews and surveys, and these rely on perceptions of developers or other stakeholders, and they may be conducted in a location of convenience. And then finally, on the bottom right, we have the data strategies, which rely on studying or experimenting with retrospective data, such as GitHub data, Stack Overflow, bug repositories, and so on. So note that three of these quadrants are annotated with the little blue figure. Oh. Did my slides change? Yes, we're back. Um, so three of these strategies here are annotated with a little blue icon. And these represent that each of these strategies involve humans in some way. And that's this is important because um, when we look at the kinds of, any time you choose a research strategy and we, we use that strategy, we are gonna have limitations. And in this view, I'm showing three desirable criteria that we may have to trade off by selecting a particular research strategy. So for example, realism, and I position this here close to field strategies because um, when we do a study in the field, we can increase the realism of the study that we do. Um, on the other hand, if we do a lab study, realism is lower, but we can increase or we have the potential to increase the control over the human, human actors in that environment. Um, and for generalizability, I've positioned that close to respondent and data strategies, because with those types of strategies, we have more uh, potential to increase the generalizability of our findings from respondent and data strategies. So let's take a look at what we have when we apply this part of the framework to um, the MZ and ICSI papers. Well, we see immediately that we have a lot of data strategies shown on the bottom right, and we have uh, a few respondent and not many lab and not many field and not many uh, non-empirical strategies either. And we, we did find that some papers did report more than one strategy and we show the triangulation here to just give you an idea of which strategies were triangulated with, uh, with, with other strategies. And you can see that there's not a lot between um, the other, um, for example, lab and field, there's not many. So that concludes my description um, of the framework. And what did we learn from this? 
So you may recall that we, when we write our papers, we're pretty quick to claim that what we're doing, uh, we wish to benefit human stakeholders. For example, if I build this tool, I'm going to increase the productivity of developers. However, when we look at what we do, we tend to focus on the technical aspects, or we focus on the data that only partially tells the stories of what humans do and why they do it. And I'm concerned about this because uh, AI for software engineering is a very big um, uh, intervent or big, uh, I guess, paradigm shift that we're seeing in our software engineering tools at the moment. And many of these tools are being developed, but without studying how humans use them and the impact on their use. And this is a concern to me because if we're not studying developers in the field, we're not really knowing what their problems are and we're not really knowing how they're using them or how it's impacting other people around them. So I call for more mixed methods so that we can increase the advantages of, of having all of these criteria. So if we do a field study and we also do a data study, then we're able to increase realism and also potentially increase generalizability. So it's important to do this. And for example, in a field study, we can also learn why developers do not adopt a particular tool. And maybe we get new ideas for research from watching why it is they're not using our tool. Um, finally, I wanted to just uh, mention that my student, Alessandra Paz Milani, who is also up and is in Victoria, and she's been uh, looking at how the framework can be used in reviewing papers. And she created this cheat sheet that she said she uses when she's reviewing papers and finds it really useful. So I promised um, that I would uh, show you how this can be applied to ESIM. Um, and actually here on the left, we also applied it to another conference. Um, at Saner, and you can see on the left uh, uh, side that with Saner, that's about software an analytics, that a lot of the papers um, are focused more on system or on system and human. You see the both there. And on the right, um, this is when we apply it to ESIM. And let me just, uh, there's a, a bit.ly link here that you can go to and you can actually use a, a visualization. Uh, to navigate around and you can see what the different kinds of papers are. So there were 42 papers at, at, at uh, ESIM or at SANER. And at ESIM, we have 24 papers. And we can see that the keywords that were entered by the authors, for example, security, um, you can see that all of the security papers, they mention one is more about humans, one is more about system, and four are about improving system and um, the humans. And uh, we can see that the types of data strategies used here were data strategies and that the results for these papers were descriptive. And so you can browse around and you can see that. One thing I want to call out here is, and that I was a little bit surprised at, is that the, re the strategies that we use are mostly data strategies. And by clicking on these other things, you can click on data, you can see how those are potentially triangulated. And in this case, we have a couple that are triangulated with respondent. Um, but there are also one paper that triangulates with data. So with that, I'm concluding and uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I hope that the slides were okay for you during that presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Megan. The slides were great. We are so sorry to have just <laughs> just few minutes for this. So we had a question that you have already answered, but I will show it anyway, just to show you that there is someone asking about the cheat sheet available. Patricia <laughs> <laughs> is there, Patricia Fernandes. So did you think of a checklist to support our the researches in such, such, uh, such classification? And she complimented because she saw the, your student checklist. Is this cheat sheet available? Um, I'll have to ask my student if she would share it, but um, I have a feeling she would. Uh, maybe we'll tweet it out later today. Um, but the paper also provides quite a bit of detail. But yeah, I'll ask Alessandra. Thank you very much, Patricia, for the uh, for the question and comment. And you have one more question for the last minute. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> so many great papers, but Teresa here is asking. Thanks for your talk. Very interesting. Giving your results. Do you have any suggestions that authors should? taking into account when writing research papers? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, actually applying this framework to the ESIM papers was quite easy because of the structured abstract. Whereas when we applied it to the MZ and the ICSI papers, it was actually really hard to figure out what the goal of the paper was. 
Um, so I think using, um, you know, this framework to help, you know, communicate who are you trying to benefit? What kind of knowledge are you trying to produce? It wasn't always easy to tell whether the paper produced a theory of some sort or whether it produced a tool. Um, and also um, I've worked with uh, Maria Teresa on uh, actually the design science work, which I'll just uh, show up here. Uh, this is also a really useful uh, tool to think about your work in terms of design science. Or is your research describing a problem or are you describing a solution or applying it? Perfect. I'm a fan of your design science research framework too. It's <laughs> also I, something you can use as a cheat sheet. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I would love to talk about the place of field studies and lab studies in these days, but we don't have much time. So <laughs> thank, thank you, you very so much. much for this great presentation. Thank now you. We, now we are going have, to have the second paper. Fernand is here with us. So another great paper about research methods too, a paper that it's very interesting for all of us. So what evidence we would miss if we do not use gray literature? Fernando, the floor is yours. Uh, Fernando, we need you to share the slides again. They were shared before, but ah, yeah, now they were, yeah. thank you very much. Wait, wait a minute. It's hard, all this setup in the same time. And... <laughs> Maybe if you share all your screen. Okay, that's it. Okay. Okay, and let's go to start. Hello, are you? Yes, okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Fernando Kambe, and I'm a PhD student at the Federal University of Pernambuco in, in Brazil. And I'm going to present our research entitled What Evidence We Would Miss If We Do Not Use Gray Literature. This research was conducted together with Gustavo Pinto. Igor Viz, Márcio Ribeiro, and Sérgio Soares. Um, so, what is gray literature? Uh, the most common definition, uh, called as Luxembourg definition, stated that gray literature is produced on all levels of government, academics, business, and industry in print and electronic format, but uh, which is not controlled by commercial publishers. Recently, uh, Carlos proposed the follow definition for software engineer. Uh, gray literature in software engineer can be defined as any material about software engineer that is not formally peer reviewed nor formally published. Um, so, to conduct this study, we had two motivations. The first is related to the increased use of social media and communication channels used by software engineer practitioners. And the second one is related to the increase of studies using or investigating gray literature. Even with the increased use of gray literature in software engineer research, uh, more specifically um, in secondary studies, uh, uh, few studies are investigating or showing how gray literature use it properly contributed to multivocal studies. For this reason, our study aimed to assess how the use of gray literature contributed to multivocal studies. Uh, in this study, uh, by contributing, we mean to understand to what extent uh, the multivocal studies use gray literature as uh, gray literature evidence to answer its research questions. Uh, we did find um, that several evidence would be missed 
if the investigated studies did not consider gray literature. To achieve our goal, uh, we employed a tertiary study to identify potential multivocal studies in software engineering. Uh, now I'm going to, to, to present uh, our results related to each research question. To the first research question, we intended to investigate how commonplace is to employ gray literature in multivocal studies. Um, we selected nine studies. Here we have these nine studies um, uh, with the total of the gray literature included as a primary source. We identified that some studies in which a gray literature source um, represent more than half of the primary sources included. Uh, we also identified that most of the research questions investigating the, in those studies were answered using gray, using gray literature together with traditional literature. But what really called our attention to this question um, was to the research questions that were answered using exclusively gray literature source. Now I'm going to talk about some finds of this, of some studies, included studies. Uh, here in this multivocal study that focused on uh, how developers architected their Android apps, uh, some finds called call our attention to this to this study. Uh, for instance, 13 out of 15 libraries used to develop uh, Android apps, and seven out of nine architectural partners, and 38 out of 42 architectural guidelines were exclusively identified in gray literature source. In this study that investigated uh, holacracy in software engineer, uh, interesting to note that two out of three research questions were exclusively answered using gray literature source. These research questions are related to the definitions and the benefits of uh, holacracy. Uh, the third research question explored the characteristics of holacracy and it was answered using both gray literature and traditional literature. Uh, but, uh, however, uh, uh, we identified some characteristics that were exclusively identified in gray literature. In this multivocal study that investigates the software, software as a service, pricing aspects, uh, from this aspect covered uh, that strategy, uh, pricing tactics, price operations, price operations were all found in gray literature source. In our second research question, we investigated how gray literature properly contributed to multivocal studies. And our last research question aimed to understand the types of gray literature included in in the investigated studies and their producers. Uh, I'm going to press the results uh, of these, these research questions together. We identified uh, 19 types of gray literature investigating these studies. The most common types were blog posts, uh, slide presentations, and the project and software description. In relation to the contributions identified, uh, the most common were to provide uh, recommendations, explanations, classifications, solution proposals, and opinions. Our attention to the contributions related to recommendations and explanations. As we can see, uh, recommendations was, the, was most identified in blog posts and guidelines and the explanations in blog posts and technical reports. Uh, finally, uh, cover attention uh, 
uh, to the few contributions that find related to, to programming, uh, such as examples using source code. And regarding the empirical contribution, we expected this, uh, this few number because, as we know, uh, that academics do not produce it, the measure of gray literature. Um, talking about the producers, uh, uh, here we have how, how each type of producer uh, contributed to each type of gray literature. As we can see, we identified several types of producer. Uh, standardization body, two vendors, open source community, practitioner, consultant company, and academia. Uh, we identified several types of contribution. Uh, but uh, we can see that practitioners and consultants and two vendors uh, produced more than 75% of the great literature uh, source. So, uh, to conduct this study, uh, we identified three challenges. The first is related to the to the difficulty to identify great literature source. Uh, as recommendation, it is important that uh, researchers always provide a classification for or for all the primary source, both traditional literature and great literature, and they also uh, classify the great literature by its types. It's important. Um, the second challenge is related to the lack of great literature information. As recommendation, it's important to the researcher provide as much information as possible about the great literature. Uh, for, for instance, uh, the type of uh, great literature, the year of the production, uh, the, who are the, the producers. And the last challenge um, is related to the difficult to identify and classify great literature contributions. We recommended that researchers conduct and separate their extraction uh, of traditional literature and great literature source, and always in the, uh, highlighting the difference between great literature and traditional literature uh, on the synthesis, the results, and the conclusions. So, in our research, we showed that some Research questions were exclusively answered using great literature source. Great literature were um, most related to provide contributions related to recommend recommendations and explanations. And the practitioners and consultants and two vendors were the most common great literature producers in that fight. So that's it. Great, thank, thank you, you so much, Fernando. So we have two questions. One is very interesting about the uh, great literature sources to use and avoid. Von Ayush. Sorry, I don't. An advice or insights on the types of great literature sources to use and avoid. Can you repeat it, Tayana? Oh, I'm sure. Uh, and we have a, a similar question here. Maybe it's easier just to, what tips can you give on how to select reliable gel sources? Uh, so okay. what's the problem with the gray literature? <laughs> mm -hmm. OK. Um, uh, to select a reliable gray literature source is important to, we have, no? we, we conducted a a uh, similar study that we investigated some criteria to how to assess the credibility of gray literature. Yes. Uh, and the, the most common uh, the most common criteria in that find were related to the to the source be renowned uh, or a uh, renowned source by or conducted by a uh, renowned authors or uh, renowned institutions or companies and the, some others uh, are related uh, to the provide a detailed information on the, the source. 
because if you have the same information about the source and characteristics of the project, for instance, uh, you can uh, access uh, better access the information to identify if the evidence is reliable or not. Yes, it's not an easy question. <laughs> yes, yeah, not is not. But uh, we explored this and have some other 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 stuff that investigate. And we had, Bayona, other other uh, manner to to assess this the credibility of a, of gray litter source, for instance. Uh, had the some studies proposed the shades of gray literature. Yeah, that you not always all everyone ever always really to know is have shades of really to, it's different uh, the idea of shades is very it's, it's great we have more questions in the chat if you please if you can uh, answer them in the chat too thank you so much for your nice presentation guys if you're interested there is uh, the preprint and also a video from Fernando in the, in the exam site. Now we will start the third paper. And now we are going to start uh, the first of four vision papers. So, Valentina, you are already here. Thank you so much. So we're yeah. going to start the third paper, please. OK. So, uh, hello, everybody. I am Valentina Lenarduzzi from uh, LUT University. And together with my colleagues, uh, Oscar Dieste and Sira Vegas from Universitat Politecnica de Madrid, and Davide Fucci from Black Institute of Technology, we would like to present you today our last vision paper that is related to define a new methodology for participant selection in software engineering experiment. Next, please. Thank you. So why we decide to do this, uh, this kind of investigation and how to promote this vision paper? In any kind of experiment that you can conduct, even if they are in a software engineering field and computer science in general, or in other in chemistry and bio biological field, the uh, selection of the participant is one of the most important and crucial steps that you have to perform. And these uh, affect negative or positive uh, the results that you will obtain. Next, please. Why? If you select uh, by purpose or by convenience uh, your participants, the effect that you can have uh, is mainly related to the general generalizability of the results. And we have two main examples of these negative effects. So the reliability of the treatment implementation and the heterogeneity of the subject. Next, please. Okay. So what we did, the first we investigate the state of the practice. So we investigate uh, what bef uh, who before us, sorry, try to uh, describe, depict and figure out this kind of problem. And we discovered that uh, in, the, in the literature, the vast majority of the, um, the process, uh, the approach, the method are mainly related to random sampling and sampling for convenience population. Next. If we inspect mainly in deep to the random sampling, so the first one that we, uh, that we highlighted, we can see that the vast majority of the papers suggest three sub steps. The first is to select the population, identify the population from which subject and object they are drawn. Second is to have a complete and perfect knowledge about the demography, the gender, the education, all the characteristics that characterize the population. And last is record the data about subject who drop out from the studies. That is also another important recommendation. Looking into this, uh, uh, this, this step, this process, so the random sampling, we highlighted one main problem that is related to the characterization of the population because we don't have a set of agreed upon dimension to define a population of interest. And what we use? We use a sort of proxy that are mainly related to the occupation, to the experience, but we are not yet able to select the right population. So next, please. 
The second uh, approach that we identify is sampling for convenience population. And what they suggest in the study that we investigated, first, check the population and validity before running the experiment. Second, uh, the population must be based on the research question that you define in your study. And the last one that is also the one most controversial is the use of professional versus student or professional versus juniors or freshmen, as you want to call. And also this approach, the sample for convenience population, lead to the problem of the population characterization. Next. So based on this assumption, based on this preliminary investigation, we define our goal. Our goal is to assess the generalability of software engineering experiment results and uh, how proposing a new methodology. We define four main research questions that will be the research question that will um, define and will be part of the part of our study in the future. So the first research question is which strategy and current apply for participant selection in software engineering experiment? We consider this first question the, uh, the baseline to start with, with, this new, with this new idea. The second is which population characteristics do research pursue in which one they disaggregate when sampling? Which factor contribute to invalidity of the selection of the participant because it's important to have the pro and cons? And which technique can be applied to improve the selection of the software engineering experiment, uh, experiment participation? So we want to have the complete uh, overview in order to define our new methodology. Uh, the next one, please. What we did right now, so which was the first step that we did, we complementary our preliminary investigation, conducting a systematic review. Uh, we selected uh, papers uh, uh, published in the last five years in the context of uh, software engineering and empirical software engineering in particular, and we deeply investigated 118 papers. And we try to identify which was the uh, process, the protocol, the method, the approach that they used to select the participant. And if they highlighted in the trust to validity, some problem uh, that can affect the validity of the study itself. So we identified that the most used participant selection are purposive and convenient samplings. So there is no knowledge about which are the relevant characteristics to define this, the same uh, the sample of the population properly. And we also identify that the existing source like Mechanical Turk, LinkedIn are less homogeneous than they seem. So this initial um, systematic review confirmed in total what um, was the problem highlighted in the last decade. Next one, please. So based on all uh, the unfortunment and uh, results that I described you, uh, we define our idea. Our idea is composed by uh, four uh, steps. The first one is the identification of the current approaches, main issues and mitigation strategies. Uh, doing much more in deep and surgically precise uh, uh, systematic literature review. Uh, on top uh, on the initial that we conducted, uh, and we want also to involve uh, experts in empirical software engineering that can corroborate the results, can validate the results uh, um, via interview and focus group. Based on the results, we define the new method, we propose the new methodology, and uh, then we will do an internal validation. With internal validation, we mean replicated first our study or replicate the study of uh, other researchers in order to identify if our method, method, method story is better uh, or is more accurate or provide uh, much more significant results with the less threat as possible. And second, we will perform an external validation asking to other colleagues that do not know nothing about the method to apply our methodology and to try to replicate the study or do new study from scratch. The, the next one, please. 
this idea, of course, for this idea, we highlighted some potential future. And we depicted three main scenarios. The first scenario is the experiment by Abe Universal Aims and Goal. Uh, through the comparison of two refactoring tools for the Java programming language, for example, of the population is very loosely defined. Uh, the second is software engineering experimentation is frequent opportunistic, so, and we, of course, consider industrial experiment the typical example. And the experiment topics also need to align with the preferences of the company, for example. And the last one is experiment may, may have a specific goal that require a very well-defined population. Through the comparison of two control uh, test case design techniques from the tester view, uh, viewpoints. The last, please. So uh, this is uh, our, uh, our vision paper and I conclude my presentation. So I would like to thank you for uh, letting me this opportunity and I'm free for the question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valentina. We have some comments here. Oh. We have two comments from Leticia Passos. Yeah. Um, good work. It is an exciting topic when it comes to measuring the knowledge of someone. A good example I remember is this course of English proficiency tests such as TOEFL and so on. And uh, I yeah. will change the comment now because it's a comment in two parts. Okay, sorry, because I don't see the question mark. <laughs> work contribute a way to measure a subject knowledge experience with a general test that provides a score like those proficiency tests. Um, yes, of course, it's one that could be considered when you characterize the population from the experience and for the basic skills. But, the, for example, this aspect that Leticia highlighted, we didn't found in our initial survey. So it's one, one uh, very, um, I'm going to say, good point of view that we have to consider in the future. But I can tell her that we didn't found any references of this particular aspect in uh, in our initial survey, in our initial review. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you, you to you the opportunity. More in the chat, please. Yes, I will. And now see we are starting. Okay, Thank you very now much. We are starting. Okay, the fourth presentation, Florian. Thank you, and you can start sharing yours. Uh, okay, thank you so much. You can start. I think that you are on mood, <laughs> as always, as we are always. So sorry. <laughs> no problem at all. <laughs> okay, then <laughs> we'll start again. <laughs> So welcome also from my side and welcome to the presentation about important experimentation characteristics. Uh, my name is Florian Auer and um, I present the research that I did together with Michael Felderer. When we talk about experimentation, uh, we mean experimentation with software changes. So small changes of an existing software that are experimentally evaluated. Um, therefore, a subset of the users is exposed to the change, uh, whereas the remaining users use the non-changed version. Differences in their behavior are measured and analyzed. As a result, the change is data-driven evaluated and an informed decision can be made whether to make the change or not. Um, other names that you can find for it are um, A-B testing or continuous experimentation. Um, this type of experimentation is used in many areas according to literature. So from evaluation of small bug fixes over optimization of configurations, trying out feature ideas or improving machine learning algorithms. It expanded also the area of testing largely and enabled testing for software like machine learning that was previously almost um, not possible with the traditional techniques. However, these are only the applications reported in literature so far. Hence, we asked what usage scenarios of experimentation exist in practice. For what is experimentation actually used in practice? 
Um, are there more applications as reported in literature? Moreover, exploring frequent application contexts of experimentation in practice could offer valuable insights into frequent requirements and limitations in practice. Um, each experiment needs to be planned and every aspect of it needs to be defined in the previous studies. We developed and used the taxonomy that describes all known characteristics and properties of an experiment. Uh, the taxonomy that you see here is based um, on a study of relevant literature that we did in previous um, research um, and on existing experimentation platforms that are used in practice. It consists of 17 characteristics that you can see here and um, they have in total 52 properties. As a result, practitioners may be overwhelmed by the number of uh, characteristics offered to define an experiment. The taxonomy provides no priorization of the characteristics. Hence, it may be difficult to decide what properties should be specified. Guidance on importance of individual characteristics is missing. Hence, we asked what are the important characteristics of them to ensure the accuracy of an experiment. And to summarize this, um, the research goal is to develop guidelines for experimentation. Therefore, first, the usage scenarios in practice need to be determined. Moreover, from all aspects that can be considered to define an experiment, the most important aspects should be determined to focus guidelines on the most important aspects. To answer the two, the two research questions, we conducted an expert survey. We sent out a question um, questionnaire per email to 213 industrial experts that we collected from relevant peer-reviewed publications. We identified the peer-reviewed publications based on two recent literature reviews in the field and uh, applied snowballing on the set of papers. In total, 15 of the 213 experts filled out the online questionnaire. That is about 7% um, of all um, experts that we contacted. We analyzed the answers and categorized them into 12 usage scenarios. They demonstrate the many usage contexts and scenarios in which experiments are used in practice by experts. For instance, regression that includes the scenarios of ensuring that nothing impacted on the customer side, evaluate whether new code has introduced regression and experiments as a guardrail. Regarding the most important characteristics, the majority of experts declared simil similar characteristics as important. According to the results, the most important aspects are to define the goal of the experiment and quantify when it is reached. Measure the collected data quality, define metrics to detect harmful experiments. And define alerting conditions as well as conditions at which the experiment should be stopped immediately. Regarding future work directions, um, the results are the first step towards to develop guidelines that support in the definition of experiments, like suggest suggesting to focus first on the most important aspects. The usage scenarios that we saw may reveal novel implications that could affect existing models, architectures, our processes discussed in research so far. Finally, the characteristics that were not considered to be the most important can be still relevant and important to consider. For instance, it seems reasonable to also think and define risk-related aspects of an experiment prior its execution. To summarize, we conducted an exp expert survey with 15 industrial experts that contributed to peer-reviewed publications. The survey revealed 12 types of usage scenarios of online controlled experiments. 
Moreover, the expert selected the most important aspects to define an experiment. The results give insights into the usage contexts in practice and the aspects of experimentation that are primarily focused by practitioners. Both results represent insights into the current application of experimentation and are useful for practitioners as well as researchers. Thank you for your attention and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you so much, Florian. What a, a great presentation and a great topic. I was I was thinking about uh, oh, now now we have one question here, so I will start with Patricia's question. Why do you think the design characters were not among the most important ones? Are they hiding somehow on the other ones? The design, uh, sorry. Uh, are you seeing the question here um, uh, in the slide, in the, in the screen? Why do you think the design characteristics were not among ah. the Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I mean, I think here is about the most important characteristics and the design characteristics may be um, sawn by the experts as um, typical characteristics that are not uh, so not especially important like uh, like alert or shutdown characteristics so these are you could say these are the basics that you need to simply define the experiment itself so this could be one reason why they are not considered as the most important characteristics by the exper experts. It was, it was indeed unexpected for me as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Gloria. It's a, a great work and we really need to talk about this. And now we have to start the fifth work. So Javier is here to... Uh, okay. Yes, I'm going to share the screen. <laughs> Thank you. So now we will start our fifth paper, Inclusion and Exclusion Criteria in Soft Engineering Tertiary Studies, a Systematic Mapping and Emerging Framework. Yeah, sorry, but I need to choose the right screen. Okay. This one. It's Okay, thank you so much, Diana, for the presentation and good afternoon or morning or evening, everyone. My name is Xavier Frank and I'm going to present this paper entitled Inclusion and Exclusion Criteria in Software Engineering Tertiary Studies. This is a joint work with colleagues from the Technical University of Catalonia, Dolores Custal, Carlos Farré and Carmacher. Okay, our work is framed in the area of systematic reviews, uh, both uh, systematic literature reviews and systematic mapping studies. In, the, in both of them, we have a baseline of primary studies related to a topic of investigation, and then secondary studies it synthesize the knowledge extracted from these primary studies. For broad topics of investigation, where a good number of secondary studies emerge, tertiary studies aggregate the results as a systematic review of systematic reviews. Selection of one type of studies into another is driven by the application of inclusion and exclusion criteria. And here we arrive to the focus of our paper. In our paper, we present a systematic mapping study to analyze the inclusion and exclusion criteria defined in tertiary studies for selection of secondary studies. More precisely, to respond uh, to this general goal, we perform um, a, a systematic mapping with four research questions. First, research question one um, compiles and categorizes, categorizes the in, inclusion and exclusion criteria found in the selected secondary studies. Then, RQ2 reports the bad smells that we found in the definition of inclusion and exclusion criteria in these systematic uh, studies. Third, uh, we have a research question that focuses on the facets that influence the application of inclusion and exclusion criteria. And the fourth question analyzes how authors are involved in the application of inclusion and exclusion criteria. 
To respond to these four research questions, our own, our own selection process performed an automatic search in Scopus followed by a backward snowballing. After applying the inclusion and exclusion criteria of our own systematic mapping study, we ended up with a total of 50 papers, uh, namely 50 secondary studies. Next, I present in one slide each the answer to these four research questions. We coded the different inclusion and exclusion criteria that we found in the 50 secondary studies into 94 different codes, and we, we grouped these codes into 15 categories. Two of them were dominant. The domain category, requiring the system mapping study to be of, of a particular software engineering area, a transversal topic like education, or otherwise the whole software engineering domain. Also, the second dominant code, the second dominant category was the SS type, the secondary study type, since the different tertiary studies, the different secondary studies were requiring um, were required to be SLRs, systematic mappings, surveys, while in other tertiary studies there were no restrictions about the type of the secondary study. It is good to mention that we had also a number of marginal categories. For instance, quality assessment, even if performed by a lot of uh, tertiary studies, which was used only by one of them to exclude secondary studies from the tertiary study. And also other um, criteria related to dates, availability or scope were often implicit and not explicitly enumerated as uh, inclusion or exclusion criteria. For the second research question, we identified 10 different smells in the definition of inclusion and exclusion criteria. They are, um, their names are summarized here. There were two that uh, were the most frequent in this um, uh, more strong orange. Uh, as commented in the last slide, we found a lot of tertiary studies that used implicitly some inclusion and exclusion criteria. And also a second problem is that the distinction between what is an inclusion criteria and an exclusion criteria is not always clear. On the contrary, we had some uh, dismiss that were not so frequent, like for instance, verbosity, like, it, like including additional information and exclusion, exclusion criteria, and also spreading, which means that one single logical criteria is spread into different inclusion and exclusion criteria. In the middle, we had other type uh, of more intermediate uh, in terms of frequency um, uh, smells, like for instance, uh, overloading some inclusion and exclusion criteria, uh, meaning that a single inclusion and exclusion criteria states different conditions. In RQ3, we uh, identified six different facets influencing the application of inclusion and exclusion criteria. The first one was the number of phases. Up to 21 uh, out of the 50 secondary of the 50 tertiary studies applied in classical and exclusion criteria in more than one phase. Also, we saw a scope as a differentiating um, concept for the tertiary studies. Uh, the most dominant type of scope was to investigate the inclusion and exclusion criteria in the title and abstract of the secondary study. Third, application, meaning uh, that mo most normally all the inclusion and exclusion criteria are applied at once, but in some of the multi-phase uh, tertiary studies, we found that some inclusion and exclusion criteria are applied only in one particular phase. For the fourth one, related to snowballing, we identified up to five different modalities of snowballing, combining, combining backwards and forwards, and also the moment in which they are executed. Fifth, except in a couple of cases, inclusion criteria were interpreted as universal quantifiers and exclusion criteria as existential, meaning that if only one exclusion criteria is satisfied, the paper is uh, not selected. And then we found some other uh, spare uh, facets that, for instance, uh, piloting or having some domain experts involved in the tertiary study or domain experts different from the authors, of course. And fourth, uh, we discovered four facets characterizing the involvement of authors. First, how the authors perform the evaluation. And uh, we found that independent evaluation prevails, but also we found some papers that uh, made some kind of supervised evaluation and other schemes. Second, identity. Um, 
we observed that it was often not reported or reported not by the actual identity, by some logical identifier, uh, just differentiating which authors were participating in which uh, activity. Third, the way in which uh, confl conflicted were resolved, consensus seeking was the most popular, but we also found voting on some other intermediate uh, solutions. And last, the way in which the consensus is reporting. It's uh, necessary to remark that uh, this aspect was often neglected in the tertiary studies and it was not a clear um, evidence on how the, the consensus was effectively conducted in the study. As a result of this state of the art, and this is, this is an emerging paper, we propose in the paper an emerging management framework for inclusion and exclusion criteria. The framework is called the SIC that is tertiary studies in question exclusion criteria. It evolves about, uh, around uh, six different dimensions. The first one, we propose to use an inclusive catalog, meaning that most of the inclusion exclusion criteria that we have compiled from the papers make sense. This is why they exist. So we are proposing to keep uh, most, the, most of them in the catalog. Second, to provide a um, series of guidelines to avoid the smells that we identified in our tertiary study. Third, and as a way to differentiate explicitly inclusion and inclusion criteria, we propose to define as an inclusion criteria those criteria that are uh, checked at search time, and then exclusion criteria are uh, applied over the result of the search. Fourth, we have defined a um, well-defined application process consisting of four steps, uh, in which we try to guide in a systematic way the conduction of the tertiary study. Fifth, uh, we provide some hints about the, the, the author's involvement and we propose independent evaluation as much as the team uh, allows to do so, aiming at consensus with periodical meetings in order to arrive gradually to such consensus. And sixth, uh, a clear and focused documentation and we provide some concrete guidelines in order to document the application process in a typical systematic mapping report or, tertiary or um, systematic literature review reporting. This is all. Thanks for your attention. And if you are interested in the topic, I also can recommend you a similar paper that is available in, in archive about how tertiary studies perform quality assessment of secondary studies in software engineering. Thanks. Thank you so much, Javier. This is a wonderful work that we are very interesting. We have already a question here from Markus Kalinowski regarding the snowballing variations. I believe that we, as a community, should be more rigorous in requiring share in the precise procedure and the search process details. What are your thoughts on this? Thanks for your question, Marcos. And I cannot more than agree with that. And in fact, this is, I would say, the ultimate goal of this paper, not just for snowballing, but for other criteria. I think it is important to do that. For instance, one of the effects that we observe while making our systematic mapping is that it is not clear if when applying snowballing, the authors apply also the inclusion exclusion criteria strictly. Sometimes it, 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 is not, it seems not to be the case. So I think that we should aim, for instance, and it is one of the recommendations, to apply the inclusion exclusion criteria systematically in the papers that are found by snowballing the same way that they are usually applied in the papers that are retrieved through the automatic search. And we have one more question, very interesting, from Marcel in the chat, but I will ask you to answer in the chat. We have to move to our final paper. Thank you so much. Great work, great, great presentation. Thank you, Tayana. Thank you. So Vinicius is here with us too. And you can prepare for your presentation too, Vinicius. Okay, okay. Great. So uh, okay, Tayana. Tayana is gone. Okay, uh, I will present my paper. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you, Tayana, for the introduction. Um, I'm representing my research group today. And in this presentation, I will talk about towards sustainability of systematic literature reviews. Well, in this presentation, we will keep talking about systematic literature reviews and a method that is being increasingly adopted for software engineering, 
But despite all of these benefits, so SLR suffers from several problems like the poor documentation and the lack of rigor in following the guidelines proposed. And to mitigate these problems, many tools and techniques were proposed. However, we can say that these problems were actually solved. And there is two main problems that remain with no suitable solutions until now. First is the conduction of SLR. It's very time and effort consuming. And the lack of impact of SLR results in industry. Well, our main research question here is, it is possible to reduce the high consumption of resources while we assure more accessible uh, results for the industry. And the main goal of this paper is to introduce sustainability of SLR, uh, a new vision on how to better deal with SLR and the high consumption of resources and the lack of impact in industry. Well, first to propose our vision, we surveyed the literature in, uh, and selected six studies uh, published in the last decade and uh, with the main problems and the possible causes for these problems. Uh, and so next we classify these barriers or possible causes in three dimensions. The social uh, are related to the human aspects. For example, the communication among researchers, the economic barriers are associated with the consumption of resources in the whole SLR life cycle. And finally, the technical barriers are related to the problems with the tools to support SLR. In the final step, we use these uh, barriers to propose this new vision. Well, uh, after the summarization, we found four main problem, problems and 31 barriers uh, related to these problems. The first problem is the lack of impact in industry. It may be caused by uh, limitations uh, of inappropriate research questions or even not generalizable results for other areas. And the second problem is the high consumption of resources that uh, there are many possible causes found for this, but uh, the, for example, the limitations of electronic databases or duplicated studies among databases may be a possible causes and there are more for them. Um, the third problem is the poor documentation that may be caused by the lack of commitment of the authors in pro providing uh, a good uh, reporting of the primary study selection or synthesis, and a lack of quality the, is the fourth problem, that some authors uh, do not use uh, a synth uh, adequate synthesis methods or just the lack of expert evaluations. But the key point here is to each of these problems can be observed through social, economic, and technical perspectives. But many of these points impact more perspectives, two or more perspectives at the same time. And to propose adequate solutions for these problems, it is necessary to observe from another, uh, from an integrated perspective. Well, to understand our vision here, uh, it is necessary to understand a little bit about sustainability. Uh, this area started in ecology to preserve their natural resources and further was adapted to software engineering uh, to preserve the software itself and to mi minimize the environmental impact. Well, sustainability was divided in three dimensions or axes, environmental, social, and economic. And in software engineering, they added the technical and individual dimensions to, uh, but there is a theoretical discussion in other areas, which dimension should be included. But our goal here uh, is to use all the knowledge accumulated in both areas to propose an adaptation for SLR. Uh, we propose that sustainability of SLR is the process to and a set of actions to make it possible to preserve SLR, to endure over time with the less possible time and effort consuming and, and, and produce an effective impact in, uh, on the industry. We initially divided the sustainability of SLR into three dimensions, uh, social, economic, and technical dimension, where the socioeconomic handle with the communication, collaboration, and effective stakeholders' participation. The economic dimensions preserve the resources consuming during the conduction, audition, or update. And the technical dimension preserve the reliability of the tools to conduct a SLR. Well, to achieve the sustainable SLR, we need to understand that these dimensions have interactions and a graphical representation may be an opportunity to better understand this. In ecology context, two 
different types of representation where proposing it became mainstream later. The weak sustainability and the strong sustainability. Uh, in the weak sustainability, the dimensions must be balanced and allowed to treat the problem separately. And despite this, th this representation seems fair, many variables to, uh, there are many variables to consider and this may lead to doubts about the feasibility of this approach. And even we con and when we consider the technical dimension as a, um, a common concern between social and economic dimensions, there are still many variables to handle. Well, another possibility uh, included in the literature is to nest all dimensions. And the key idea here is to respect a hierarchy. This is called strong sustainability. In other words, this representation doesn't allow to treat problems separately. Uh, a possible problem with this representation is to choose which dimension have a higher priority. And if we put social constraints higher than other constraints, we, we can have accessibility for industry problems or put economic constraints maybe lead to poor quality of SLR. Well, actually, this paper, uh, observing the results of our paper, we can conclude that the, there is a lack of knowledge about the SLR process and the lack of commitment of applying these good practices that leads to poorly documented and uh, SLR that can be replicated or updated. Well, in this paper, we propose to change the perspective of researchers and observe the current scenario in a holistic way and, and aims to raise awareness that it's not possible to solve all these problems without an integrated solution. And finally, we bring the disruptive idea of sustainability of SLR that can be a key concept to change the mindset of the researchers while proposing new solutions for SLR. Well, thank you for your attention and I'm open for questions. Thank you so much, Vinicius. I'm sorry for the bug in the beginning. Great work, uh, very interesting, very necessary to discuss all of these problems. And we have, uh, I have a question as a professor too, because I, I want to include your slides. Are your slides available anywhere? <laughs> Just to show my students in empirical engineering classes. Okay, this is, we have a lot to talk about. Unfortunately, we have, uh, we don't have much time. I have a, a comment here from Marcela. I will show you. I don't understand how you can preserve longevity if time passes and the cellulars stay out of date. Well, uh, this is a problem. This is actually a problem that is faced by many researchers and they try to mitigate this proposing uh, many techniques for update and technique, techniques or tools, but uh, preserve longevity in sustainability aspect is to create some results that can be further used for uh, 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 several types of areas. And these results uh, are preserved to, to be used in a, in a bunch of contexts. And, and maybe the, the, the longevity is to we can update these results. And this is not uh, just a, a paper that is remain on the, only in the, the electronic data, databases and no one does nothing with these results. This is the, the longevity of SLR. And if we can think uh, in an integrated way, uh, we can preserve the longevity and actually assure that this result will be useful for everyone who wants to use it. This is, uh, this is how longevity uh, uh, can be preserved. It is actually a concern for everyone, but we are trying to fix this. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, we have to finish now. We have one more, one more question in the chat, a very interesting one. Uh, so I will just show you here very quickly. Uh, we keep conducting and publishing SRRs. To what extent do you think few they target practitioners? I think that everyone can answer this one in the chat too. Just to just a challenge for every author. This session was great. Thank you so much. Uh, great presentations, great papers. Please read the papers. The, uh, all papers are already available at SCN uh, Digital Library. And in five minutes, we are having another session starting. 
uh, testing and security. Okay, so we see you there. Thank you so much. Bye.